and it worked. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tuesday and a branch of laurels. My name is Ashaxi, and I am a laurel from Ontier. And tonight I am interviewing Domingo, who is a laurel from Aitenfeld and also a member of the Chivalry. Welcome. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you for uh, doing this with me. Thanks um, for asking. Yeah, super exciting. Uh, I usually start these off by asking what your SCA origin story is. Well, for me, it was decades ago, back in the mid 80s. Um, I got a call one morning from a person I had just met asking me to go to a Ren fair. Now, in my defense, the phone call was at 530 in the morning. I was half asleep. I just said, OK, and jumped in a car, drove across town. I was living in Panama City, Florida at the time. And then we drove from Panama City to Pensacola, where we got into another car to drive the extra hour to get to Mobile, Alabama, where they were having an event called Magna Fair, which was at the time the Magna Carta was touring the US and it just happened to be doing a show in, uh, in Mobile. And the local then Shire, now Barony of Osprey was hosting a mini event to help celebrate that with them. And so, we pulled off of I-10 into a parking lot and I see people hitting each other with sticks, people dressed in odd attire and uh, we get out of the car and everybody else starts putting on tunics and whatnot. I'm like, you know, if you would have told me what this really was, I actually had some tunics from Halloween a couple of years ago I made. And like, oh, sorry. So they gave me some loaner gear and uh, I hung out with a bunch of people, had a great time and just kept going with it. Wow. Uh, so you started in Florida is? This is the meridian part of Florida. Okay. The Northwest Panhandle is still meridies from the time date line just east of my original hometown uh, in Florida. Eastward to Tallahassee, you get to the first group that's actually in uh, Trimeris. And that part and the rest is uh, Trimeris the Northwest Panhandle is still Meridies. I'm learning. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> I've lived in a few kingdoms. That's really cool. Um, was there somebody that mentored you um, at, in the beginning? I mean, how did you get from the Magna Carta event to regular SCA? Well, when we got back to Florida and uh, I got invited to go to a few more events, there was a gentleman that was uh, retired Air Force that was running one of the local game shops that I played D&D at. And he says, oh, yeah, I used to play up in East Kingdom, but I didn't realize that we had a group. And again, pre-internet, all paper trail kind of days and long distance phone calls were three bucks a minute, which was a bit pricey back in those time days. Yeah. Um, he found out that uh, I was getting into it, says, hey, I can get back into that. And he was actually, his name was Dave Halterman. He had an alternate persona of Chin Su, the cook. And he was the one that actually got me interested in historical cooking. Oh, beautiful. And uh, I actually mentored with him, uh, did a couple of feasts as his second. And then the third feast our Shire put on, I jumped to the front and he became number two. And I, that was my very first one that I was the sole and head feastocrat having to plan everything, do all the logistics and make sure everything went out on time. How, and how long did it take you, like how many years were you in the SCA before you were doing a feast on your own? Three. Wow, that's really fast. I come from a family where food is love. So I started cooking, God, in my preteens. And, uh, you know, my mother was a very prolific cook and she had no problem teaching any and all the kids how to cook something. That's awesome. Um, and do you continue to cook? Is that something that you still are doing? <laughs> uh, yes. And my friends will vouch for that. Uh, <laughs> I like to think that I've got one of the largest uh, historical culinary libraries in my city. Wow. Because I, I keep looking and buying books. Uh, and even the bad books, some of them I keep as a cautionary tale to other people because there were books published, you know, 30 years ago that are so bad in both research and recipe creation 
that I have to show them to people whenever I teach a classing. This is why you look at the book before you buy it or before if someone gives it to you, what to look for before you try to use it. Um, there's a particular book I will not go into the name of here, but uh, a particular recipe that uh, another mentor of mine uh, years later said he had to judge a recipe from that turned into artichoke stuffed blueberry rice paste. And then about a few years later, after I had been elevated and moved to another kingdom, I had to judge the same dish and it was blueberry crunchy rice stuffed artichoke. And I, I had to take the person aside and say, good attempt. Here's what you might not know about this particular book. Um, but I used it as a learning experience and, and tried to give them positive feedback, even though the rice was undercooked. <laughs> Man, what a nightmare. <laughs> Floki says you made some pretty amazing food a couple of weekends ago. So uh, I guess yes. you're still cooking. Okay, my cat is being obnoxious. Yes. So um, <clears throat> Meridies, and then where did you end up going from there? So I started Meridies in the uh, mid 80s, joined the Air Force in 88. And when I joined the Air Force, ended up moving to Drakenwald. I was stationed in Germany during the end of the Cold War and the Gulf War. Um, met a lot of amazing people, many of whom I still keep in contact with, um, both uh, from the Shire that I was in and the rest of Drakenwald as a whole. I've got a lot of very good, strong friendships uh, from that group. Um, in fact, the, the person I ended up squiring to, uh, Johannes von Bruckenheim, he and I are still very close. I went up and visited him last weekend. We both had our shots. We felt comfortable with each other. And him and his wife, love him to death, enjoy visiting with them. And uh, you know, there's a, just a number of, of close friendships you develop in that kind of situation. For sure. For sure. How long were you um, stationed over overseas? Uh, about three and a half years. Uh, went all over Germany. Of course, saw castles, saw museums. Uh, just enjoyed the the local, the local culture, the local people, as well as doing SCA events and, and items of that nature. And then after I left Drakenwald, I ended up back in Meridies one shire over from the shire that I helped found. And I was only there for 18 months before the Air Force yet again saw fit to move me. So I went from uh, Florida, uh, Meridies, Florida, to Las Vegas, Nevada, which is Starkoffin and Kaid. And uh, I was there for two years. Uh, again, made a lot of good friendships there. Uh, a number of people that I started with there aren't there anymore because Vegas is a very transient community. Uh, let's see. And then at the end of that, I ended up getting a short tour to Korea, a one year, here you go kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to Korea and I'd been there about six months and I get a phone call and my boss like, Hey Barnes, you got a phone call. It's like, okay, no idea what's going on. Uh, Sir, is Airman Barnes here? How can I help you? It's like, yeah. Is this a Sergeant Barnes that was stationed in uh, Germany? It's like, yeah. Stationed at Han Air Base? Yeah. That was in the SCA? Who is this? <laughs> hey, dude, it's Sir Wolfram. It's like, how the heck did you know I was here? Oh, Ben and Gill told me. It's like, how the hell did you know them? It's like, they're across country in the, at Sugi. It's like, okay. I ended up knowing three different couples that were stationed in Japan at the same time that I either known from Florida or from Europe. Wow. And so, you know, I took a week or two couple of weeks off, flew to Japan, went to 12th night, and then just couch surfed uh, my way across Japan for a couple of weeks. How fun. That's awesome. It, it, it I've always been curious about, um, kind of the subculture of, of the military and the SCA, because it seems like 
there are an incredible amount of ex-military and military in the SCA. And I grew up a military brat, so I have a little bit of an insight into that culture, but um, how does that mesh with the SCA? Well, I always used to joke back in the early days that uh, if you have a major military installation or a university, you're bound to have an SCA group there. And uh, up until the last 10 years, that was pretty much fairly true. Uh, most major military installations had an SCA group and most universities had either an, a, a, an SCA college or a group that was associated near the university that they could attend. Um, because that was a big feeder group for the SCA at the time. Right, right. And whenever I get the chance and the, the group I'm in has a college, uh, an SCA college group, I try to help mentor them because again, you know, the youth is the next generation. And if we're not mentoring them and helping them feel welcome in the group, we're not going to get a lot of fresh blood in. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so you ended up in Kaid for two years. And then after that, you went to eight felt. Yes. After, uh, <laughs> after uh, I was in uh, star coffin, went to the then Palatine Bear near the far west, and then from there ended up in Tucson, Arizona, which is uh, the Barony of Triscothier. And again, I ran into people I was stationed somewhere with in Germany, who was, I think, the at the time, the Baron and Baroness of that group. Wow. And uh, then, see, I was actually... This was one of the, the oddball things in the military. I was actually stationed there for a total of 10 years before they saw fit to move me again. And in the 10 years I was there, uh, my ex-wife and I were the landed Baron and Baroness for that group. Wow. And uh, had a great time, a lot of friends there. Um, you know, some of my students uh, were from that group or from other groups in Aidenbelt or in other kingdoms. And then, right about the 10 year mark, the Air Force saw fit to move me again. And this time it sent me to the, the, the northern areas of Denver, Colorado, which has snow. And if you'll note, with the exception of Germany, I'm a Southern, I was born in the Philippines, lived in Florida. Those were the two places I lived as a military brat. The only white I'm associating with anything is beach sand. And now you're sending me someplace that has snow regularly. And the people there lied. They said, oh, yeah, it snows here, but it, it melts in a day or two. The first winter I was there, it snowed a foot or so on the Friday before Christmas. And for the like the next three Fridays, it snowed a foot. When it came time for me to go to Australia in February, my trailer was about chest deep in snow. I'd have a couple of my buddies from the, the Canton help me shovel it out. Luckily, we had a snowblower once we got one trough dug out. But yeah, getting a, a uh, you know, four, four and a half feet of snow out from a trailer just to go down to an event. Good times. Was daunting. <laughs> but I enjoyed that for three years, pulled some strings in the military to get back to Arizona. Um, went back to Tucson for another three years. And then my 23, 24 years in the military was over. I get to retire. And my wife, uh, then takes the reins and her job, she's an architect. She gets a job offer in uh, Dallas. So once again, we pack up, we move. We end up in, uh, in the wonderful central area of Onstiora known as Dallas, Texas or uh, Barony the Steps. And uh, again, great people, great time, uh, a lot of fond memories and uh, a lot of great, like, just a lot of fun stuff to do there. And you know, being both an armored fighter and a fencer and an artisan, you know, it's like, if you want to go fencing, go to Texas, you will find people to fence. It was a great time. And uh, like I said, we stayed there for seven years. And then my wife found a way to get back to Arizona. We couldn't go back to, to uh, Tucson, but she was able to find an architectural job back in Phoenix and close enough to Tucson. So once again, we uproot and move back to Aidenbelt. You know, we're, they may not like us, but you know, we're not gonna leave. We keep coming back. 
<laughs> third time is a charm, hopefully. So, you know, we get back about two and a half years ago and uh, settling back in, learning new, you know, in a new barony, learning their ways, because every barony is its own creature. Yeah, for sure. For so. sure. Like every kingdom is its own creature. So that's a lot of moving around. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I've noticed in um, interviewing people is the more people move around, the harder it is um, to walk that journey of, of you know, the peerage journey. Um, how, how was your journey? I don't know, which peerage did you, were you recognized with first? Um, I received my laurel first, then my chivalry, and then I was put on notice for uh, Ministry of Defense just before the plague hit. So I'm still a vigilant for that peerage and will receive it once we are safe to once again attend in person. Awesome. But uh, yes, I, I got my laurel first and, you know, my running joke was, you know, if I just get the uh, arts award for each kingdom I visit, I should be fine, right? <laughs> because uh, when I left Meridies, I had the Velvet Owl, which at the time was their grant level award for arts. Um, I got the, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember all the names of the various arts awards I received in various places. Um, but yeah, I, you go to a kingdom, get an arts award. And then I was lucky again, when I had moved to uh, Aitenvelt, there were uh, the Laurel that I was the student from and um, other good friends of mine who were also Laurels. And from the fact that they actually settled down were actually very good advocates for me saying, yeah, this guy's been moving around every two or three years, but look at the quality. Right. So again, I, I had the benefit of people willing to stand up and say, yeah, they're moving around, but they're doing the job. And I try to do the same thing whenever I, I see someone move into a new group, regardless of which of the circles I'm speaking for. Uh, it's a lot easier nowadays with the internet and cross kingdom communication. You can, it's easier to verify stories and not just go, eh, yeah, this is what they say, but you know, what are they, what's really going on? Yeah. Yeah. We, um, our council definitely asks the council of other kingdoms, um, Hey, this person is from your place and, uh, they're doing really great work. Where, where were they at with you guys? Um, so that's that, I know in my kingdom, that definitely happens. We definitely, we talk <laughs> because we want to lift people up and promote people. Right. And, um, it's unfortunate if you do a ton of work somewhere, um, that you move and you lose all that. I think that that shouldn't happen. So. So did you, were you apprenticed to someone or did you just sort of have people that advocated for you? Uh, I was apprenticed to Mistress Rondonella de Tirol. Um, she was in the same shire I was in, in, uh, in Drakenwald. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I moved to Tucson from Korea, she was in the same barony as I was in. So I finally got to actually spend time in the same kingdom and the same group as my Laurel. And uh, also, as I said, uh, Sir Johannes, who was uh, also a Laurel, uh, a great mentor and, and just a great sounding board. You know, I, I had a lot of good people backing me up and helping me. That's wonderful. Um, what from those relationships have you carried over into your relationships with your students today? Well, let's see. One of the one of the uh, interesting aspects, uh, especially from my time as uh, Johannes Esquire, we eat our young. We have tough love. <laughs> you know, we're willing to cut each other down, but we don't let anybody else 
cut us, cut us down. We're willing to have fun and, and, and harp on each other, but we will tighten up if somebody else messes with us. And we've got a lot of good friendships, a lot of strong friendships. And, you know, we support each other, but we're also willing to be friends and, and poke fun at each other to keep, we have to keep things real. So, so there's no sugarcoating stuff. No. <laughs> do you, um, do you do a contract with your students or is it just sort of an informal? I, I start with, with the, the latest batch I've done you know, test time. Let, let's do six months and I'll give you a couple of projects and see what you do and see how you do the projects and give them something that stretches their abilities and capabilities. Also see if they ask questions, ask for help. Because I ask for help still. I know, I don't know everything about everything. Just because we have the little roller wreath doesn't mean we know everything. So I expect them to ask questions and don't feel bad about asking questions. You know, if, if, if we're afraid of asking questions, then we do a disservice. And if we don't encourage them to ask questions, we're doing them a disservice. There's, there's a certain level of humility that you have to have to admit that you don't know everything. Oh, I don't have humility at all. Oh. <laughs> They will tell you, I am not a humble person. I'm willing to ask questions, but I'm not going to be humble about it. <laughs> okay, well, that ruins my angle on that. <laughs> um, I'm getting comments that you are excellent at giving uh, people who are not your students great advice, guidance, and assistance, especially when asked. Oh, yeah, I'm willing to talk people's ears off if they ask me a question. Um, and if, if we as peers aren't willing to sit down and talk with anybody that asks us a serious question, as long as this, per, as long as this is a person we know will hopefully listen to us and possibly take the advice, because we've all met the same people that they ask the question, but we know they're not going to take the, the answer because seven other people have already told them what they didn't want to hear and you're the eighth person and they want to find someone that's going to tell them what they want to hear. Right. And those are the people that, yeah, I'm not going to bother with. But if you have a, a person that is learning something and they're willing to listen to you, I have no problem sitting down and talking with them. I may not always have the time to talk to them right then. And I, I try to reassure them, it's like, yeah, I really have this that I have to take care of right now, but I am willing to talk to you and I do want to talk to you. Can we find another time? And sometimes that's hard to say because you're so busy, but um, I, I encourage people to keep trying <laughs> and recognize that sometimes timing is bad. Yeah. And you know, for people like me that, you know, I, I might be on the armored uh, field today and then the rapier field this afternoon. And, you know, it's like my, my, my head's in the fighting game right now. I, I really appreciate the question, but I'm, I'm trying to stay focused on killing somebody right now. Can we talk about it later? Yeah, for sure. Um, so you mentioned earlier that cooking is kind of, I, I'm assuming your main geek. Uh, as far as the arts go. Um, but it seems like you also have put a lot of energy into persona development. Yes, in, in both a serious and comical format as well. Um, my name, my, my full name, Domingo Diego Diaz de la Vega y Martin de Valencia y Avila, El Conquistador, Lo Cruzado, La Montaña. <laughs> um, the La Montaña additive was uh, I was cooking a feast in Star Coffin, which is Vegas, and I'm elbow deep stirring a pot, trying to make sure everything's going well, and I get called into court. And, you know, somebody's got a little walkie-talkie, says, hey, they need you in court. I'm like, no. And they just stopped. And they looked at me, it's like, what? He says, look, I'm cooking a feast. 
if they want this on time, go away. And so they radioed back to the, the Herald and then they get their earbud buzzes back and they're like, what? And he's like, the court's coming here. I'm like, oh, well, you know, if Mohammed won't come to the mountain. <laughs> so I have them set a little ice chest up right outside the door, throw a, a tablecloth over it. And then, you know, just as they get in, they brought the, uh, plop the chairs down. They reopen court. I'm, I'm sitting there. It's like, please be seated. Call me into court. Neil, get an award. Thank you. Recess the court, stand up, walk away, go back in, keep stirring the pot. Um, let's see, uh, Crusado, I have been to the sandbox. I went on crusade. Um, as for the, uh, the more other whimsical part, uh, Domingo de la Vega. Anybody who likes Zorro knows he is Diego de la Vega. So I'm his great, great, great grandfather. <laughs> And you know, one of my favorite movies is Zorro the Gay Blade. So dressing well is an, not just an option, it's imperative. Of course. And do you do your own costumes or does someone do costume? Oh yes, you? I can't afford Jose. <laughs> yes, um, I've, I've always tried to make my own clothes uh, and, and, and research them and do them the best as I can because I've seen what they charge in the real world to look good. And, you know, I, I just, I'm not willing or I do not have sufficient funds to drop a thousand bucks on an outfit or 1200 bucks on an outfit and then get the rest of the wardrobe to go with it. Right, right. Uh, one of the early things somebody said to me when I started in the SCA was, um, do you have more money or more time? And it, it's always been time for me. And so, you teach yourself to do the things that you want, right? <laughs> Money, time, and ability, and the willingness to learn a new art. And I'm always willing to learn a new art, but I also have to tell myself when the art is past my level of skill competency. <laughs> Johannes tried to teach me, you know, armor making. And after like three to five minutes of me hitting a piece of steel with a hammer, Yet the frustration level just went out the window. He just said, move aside, <laughs> do it like this. <laughs> okay. That's me with scribal arts. My master was like, you are never allowed near any scribal stuff ever again. I was like, I'm good with that. It's not my passion. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Tried it once. It looked like a seven-year-old did it and I'm not a good one. <laughs> I think that's fine. I, you know, you don't have to be good at everything. You, you should find a few things that you love and do them well. Yeah. So what are, what are your other loves? <sighs> Fighting, cooking, and looking good. In a nutshell. And, you know, the latest for me is trying to find all the right dress accessories because you can have a great doublet and, and, and trunk hose or Venetians or whatever, but you know, you need the right belt, the right belt pouch, the right sword hanger, uh, the right shoes, you know, and, and then all the other bling that goes with it. Yep. So these things are, these things are important. <laughs> and when I go camping, I bring my full kitchen with me because, well, you don't want to eat poorly at war. Uh, so when did you start learning uh, to cook outside? Well, because that, that's a whole that's a whole thing on its own, right? Yes, and being from the deep south, you learn a little bit about Dutch oven cooking. Yeah, yes, you can use cast iron in the oven, and that can simulate an open fire, but not quite. And then over the years, I've slowly acquired, you know, uh, Dutch ovens and cast iron pots from thrift shops, flea markets, or swap meets as they're called out west, and or traded things to other people to get things. I traded a pair of Lance Connect pants for a fire pit, and then added on to the fire pit so I have a spit for it. Nice. And then. Uh, 
a griddle for it, a uh, barbecue grill, side for it, and all, all, a lot of other things to help make it more cooking friendly. I've cooked everything from paella to flan uh, wow. using an open fire and open flames. Do you focus on um, a certain uh, country or culture with your food? When I'm doing a themed feast, yes. Uh, some of the feasts I've done were strictly singular country. I, uh, I did one feast almost completely out of uh, Libre de Cocina from Roberto de Nola. Um, I've done a feast where it was a three course feast and one was from, I think it was a baronial investiture where one course was from his persona, one course was from her persona, and then the third course was from a third country just to round it out. And I always try to include subtleties of some form in the feast. Uh, somebody says that you made them a beautiful espresso drink in the middle of the desert before a portable espresso was a thing. How did you figure that out? Well, um, again, it's having the right tools. And I happen to have been at a uh, swap meet out here. And it was one of the uh, cast aluminum espresso pots I saw at a thrift shop. And there's a brass valve on the side that's an overpressure valve. And so I picked it up. I knew exactly what it was. It's an Italian espresso maker. And I look at the, uh, the valve and the gentleman behind the counter looks at me and says, yeah, I want 10 bucks for that, uh, but I don't have the plug for it. And it's like, oh, the plug that goes in here, pointing at the brass blowback nozzle. It's like, yeah, I, says, I think I might have one at home that'll fit it, you know, it's a, but it's 220, not a 110, because this is Italian. Would you take five bucks instead? <laughs> He's like, okay. <laughs> Go home, clean it out, test it out on a little uh, butane stove. Perfect espresso. Nice. And uh, it was a, a, a point at an Australia war court where I'm sitting on one side and the king is being very verbose. So I, I make a motion to one of my ladies in waiting who comes up, brings my coffee pot, pours me a, a, uh, a fresh cup of uh, French press and then takes my uh, ISI whipped creamer, tilts it up and squeezes and you hear the foam going <laughs> And the queen just looks at me because <laughs> she knows exactly who's sitting next to her and knows what's going on. She looks at me, her hand goes out and I just like grab the cup from my lady in waiting, hand it to her majesty. <laughs> like, well, there goes my cup of coffee. Oh, <laughs> but it's the queen. So what can you do? Hey, white scarves are here to serve at their pleasure. There you go. So um, how do you balance all of that? How do you balance cooking uh, all of your meals at a camping event with fighting and meetings and whatever else you might be doing? I have poor time management skills. How's that? <laughs> um, one trick is always trying to plan your meals out ahead of time. Uh, I remember at uh, one great Western where I went to with uh, a couple of friends of mine, where we woke up in the morning and there's a dish we call Mingo hash, which is, you know, you chop up a kielbasa and a half a pound of bacon, you throw it in a, uh, a Dutch oven over the fire. And as it's uh, heating up and the bacon's cool or uh, crisping up, you peel and dice a couple of turnips and an onion. You throw that in, you toss it around a bit and the fat from the meat soaks into the turnips. You get a wonderful flavor, dish it out, eat it up. It's carb heavy. It'll keep fighters going for a day for at least half a day. We get done with that, rinse it out. And then uh, I fill it up like halfway with water. And actually, I brown beef, uh, I brown diced beef in it first, fill it up halfway with water, and put it over a low set of coals. And we finish putting on our armor, go fight. Oh wow! Come back about lunchtime, add a little bit, uh, add more spices and whatnot in, and uh, check the meat. Then go shopping, come back, and then 
toss in barley, stir it. 20 minutes later, the barley is done. You now have beef and barley. Dish that out while everybody's starting to cook dinner. Then you throw the cast iron over the upside down on the fire to let it cook out. And uh, yeah, you're done. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> that doesn't sound like poor time management to me at all. <laughs> well, you know, that and when we camp at war with uh, the crew, everybody gets a different day to uh, cook at war. So you're not the only one stuck doing it. You just know one day you are. And you pre-plan as much ahead of time. Yeah, I, uh, I, have such a hard time balancing all that that we eat completely out of the cooler. I pre-cook everything <laughs> and it's all cold food and my husband hates it. He likes to have warm food at events, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> so <laughs> vacuum seal and boil in a bag can be your friend. I don't even want to deal with the fire. I just don't want to deal. I've had little kids in the SCA for the past 18 ish years. Now they're old enough that we could probably do that, but I don't know. <clears throat> so um, talk to me about your journey to knighthood. Well, I'd always enjoyed fighting. I've been fighting since, again, the mid 80s when I started. And you know, after I got my laurel and I was still fighting, going to tournaments, going to war, having a great time, I finally decided that, uh, well, I'm having fun at this. I'm starting to do pretty good out there, but I need someone to kick me in the butt to get me going in the right direction. So again, going through the Friends Network, I go to Sir Johannes, who is uh, at the time a light night laurel as well, and uh, say, okay, I want to be a squire because I want to be a knight. And of all the nights I know, you're the one I respect the most to kick me in the butt and get me going in the right direction. And he's like, okay, you know, we're not gonna sugarcoat things. We eat our young here, so I'm gonna put you through the ringer. And he did. And uh, corrected my behavior as needed. Got me going the right direction and uh, went from there. Did you do a lot of um, technique training or, or was it more kind of learn on the fly? Well, I already had the basic techniques. It was more of a polishing than a roughing out. Um, because again, having lived in a number of different kingdoms, you pick up uh, training wherever you go, whenever you can. Right. And uh, I got a lot of good training, but I never had anybody that polished me up. And there are a lot of fighters out there that need polishing. I was one of them. You know, I would always do decently, but I didn't do great. And, uh, and so by polishing, do you just mean fine tuning of skills? Yes. Uh, fine tuning my abilities to, to transmit the shot, hit where I need to hit. I was hitting okay, but not hitting crisp enough, or you know, my, my point target wasn't quite where it needed to be. So you know, the, the fine tuning of, of the body and the body mechanics into what I was doing. Um, and how did that tie into rapier fighting for you? Because you can kind of get out of balance one, one way or the other. Yes and no because the, the, the foundation for any martial art, regardless of the martial art, is footwork. If you don't have good footwork, you can't do martial arts. If you have good footwork, you can transition from one to another to the other, whether it's armored combat, unarmored combat, uh, rapier combat, you know, any kind of martial art, once you have that footwork down and know how to move your body, everything else can fall into place. I have decent footwork, but it was the rest of the body that needed to fall into place. 
and there's just slight transitions, uh, mainly power delivery. With rapier, you're not supposed to hit hard, so we don't. And I had the target, I just needed to pump up the volume on the power. So you were a rapier fighter first? No. No. <laughs> I'm all over the place. No. Uh, at the time I started fighting in Meridies, uh, rapier was not allowed. Mm. Um, Meridies was one of the last holdouts of we don't lap rapier, we ain't going to do rapier. Mm. And Trimeris, as soon as they became a kingdom, which I want to say was, I think, 86. Um, as soon as uh, as uh, Trimeris became a kingdom, uh, Robin of Gilwell, who was living in uh, Florida at the time, a, a uh, fencer from Anciora, basically says, I want to do rapier here. Here's the Anciora rule set. I changed the name to Trimeris. Can we do it? And they said, yes, we are doing this. Nice. And rapier then became a thing. So that was an hour to 90 minutes away. I would travel. I would drive you know, the 90 minutes to Oldenfeld from Panama City, just so I could go, you know, do a little bit of rapier here and there. It was uh, one of the times I asked a knight in uh, Ridier's, what does it take to become a knight? One of the things he said is, you must be fluent in all weapons forms. You don't have to be an expert, but you must be fluent. Mm -hmm. And here's this new thing called rapier over in another kingdom. It's like, well, that's another weapons form. I must learn it. And yeah, I, it's a different type of fighting, requires a different skill set slightly. So yeah, let's learn it. Very cool. Um, what is what uh, what is your uh, what is your primary weapons form? Uh, heavy weapons. Um, there are those that call it case. There are those that call it Florentine. And again, speaking of uh, Robin of Gilwell. He found a case, uh, he, he found the terminology in one of the old rapier texts where they specifically mention a style of fencing using two swords from the city of Florence in the 16th century. So Florentine is a proper term for two, uh, two sword fighting. So, and I will still use the term Florentine. A case of swords, which is a matched pair of swords is also a term, but I, I enjoy fighting two stick Florentine, case of swords, however you want to term it. Awesome. awesome. Um, do you want to look at some pictures? Sure, let's get embarrassed. <laughs> okay. So tell me about this photograph. Okay, this is about 1986, 87, I believe. And this was a newspaper clipping of me at a demo in Fort Walton Beach, the Shire of Phoenix Glade. Uh, I'm holding a leather breastplate that I made for myself uh, to fight in at the time. And the outfit I'm wearing is brown crush velvet velour. Yes. yes, even I wore that stuff back in the day. That was me early in my career, just starting to make doublets and trying things out. And and in, in 1986, 87, how are you getting patterns and, and how did you learn to work with leather? Uh, the patterns for the uh, soft kit, the clothing, I would go to the thrift shop and get a button up shirt. And then I would have, uh, Friends help pin me, pin it snugly to me, and adjust the seams because back then, looking at pictures, you could see the seams on the were not down the side of the doublet, but slightly to the back and at a slight V. So right. instead of cutting it straight down the side, I would have them pin it appropriately where the seams looked like they should be, and take that and put it on a piece of, of large newsprint or uh, brown paper pin it out and then get some old bed sheets, cut that out, pin it back together, try it on and nip and tuck as needed. Um, That's amazing. Did you have, uh, did, did one of your parents sew? I mean, how did you, or was that just totally intuitive on your part? 
Um, my mother uh, knew how to sew and she was one of the people that taught me the basics, the real basics of sewing. Uh, she was more sewing for females. So when it came to men's clothes and especially the, the, the men's pants of the 16th century, she was totally clueless. So I just adapted what she could teach me and, and went from there. Wow, that's fantastic. And then the leatherworking? Um, my dad had uh, learned uh, basic leather tooling and whatnot. And he had taught me that as uh, when I was in my early teens. And so I just extrapolated again from that using the pat same pattern concept. And instead of using paper, I used a hard, a, a, like poster board and cut that to fit to, to get as close to shape as possible. And then I just riveted things together. Wow, how old were you at this point? Uh, 21, 22. Okay. I love that you just had a had a, a sense of you can make whatever you, you need to. Like you can just do it. Well, failure is always an option. If you're not trying and failing, you're not learning. For sure, for sure. You must have grown up in, a, in an environment that encouraged that kind of creativity. I like to think so. You know, we were always trying new things. That's so awesome. here is Drakenwald. This is, I want to say 1990-ish. And a friend of mine, uh, Carl von Helfig, he was the last Prince of Drakenwald. And he has been a, uh, one of the princes out in Awerth a couple of times. He actually bought me the breastplate and tacit set for that kit. The Morion that I'm wearing is to the best of my knowledge, and if anyone can correct me, uh, please do so. But I believe that was the first list legal Morion in the SCA. It was made by uh, Count Siosai McSiosai from Black Sword Armory out at the time in, I think, Gainesville, Florida. I met him at Penzik the year before I joined the Air Force and he had had a display Morion out and I said, can you make this list legal and how much? Because I talked to every other armorer out at, uh, at Penzik that year because I really wanted a Morion. I fell in love with the hat. And, you know, he had this dress Morion out and he looks at me and it's like, hmm. And he gets this far away look in his eye and he grabs the helmet says, hold this on your head right there. And then he just walks around me left and right. It's like, okay, I've never done it before, but I think I can. It's going to be a little pricey, but here's what I'm going to do. And so I took what I had left of my life savings and put a deposit down. And then uh, about after, what, eight months of being in Germany, I finished paying it off in monthly installments. And got it in the mail and I was just so tickled pink. Wow. It was, it, it's one of my favorite helmets ever. And I still fight in Morion to this day. That's fantastic. I think helmets are the most important. I mean, obviously your, your brain is really important. <laughs> okay, this is me marshalling at Crown List in Aiton Belts about two years ago. And is the Shaola um, pilgrimage thing? Uh, yes. Um, for those familiar with the Catholic pilgrimage to the city of Santiago de Compostela, uh, the shell is the symbol of the pilgrimage. And um, I just decided to, I, I found the biggest shell I could to put on my hat just because uh, <laughs> I am in the Kingdom of Aitenveld, there's an award called the Pilgrim of the Desert. And then it's upper level award, the Commander of the Pilgrim of the Desert, which I have both of. And, uh, you know, as a pilgrim, I feel proud to bear that shell wherever I can. Very cool. What, what is, um, what is it recognition for? Uh, the Pilgrim of the Desert is an award for essentially holistic SCA embodiment of the dream. 
So being the whole package. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, I couldn't get you a better picture of this at the, in the short time, but a friend of mine who's a big South Park fan uh, made this for me. And uh, he would made one originally a number of years ago, and then I'd lost it. I, when he made, uh, I went back to him and says, hey, I lost this, can you make me another one? So on the left, as you see it, it says, is his ego bigger? And on the right, it says cherubs. When did he get freaking cherubs? <laughs> so. Uh, this is me at, uh, I believe, Kingdom Arts and Science, giving feedback while noshing them some uh, food after packing up. And as you can see, we're deep in discussion here. <laughs> and uh, the doublet that I'm wearing, which is the one I'm wearing currently, is based off of the doublets worn by the uh, Knightly Order of Santiago. Uh, they were the knights in charge of protecting the pilgrims on their route to Santiago de Compostela. Very cool. And did did you get interested in that order before you became a pilgrim of the desert or was that kind of? It's sort of a hand in hand thing. Um, you know, I, I became a, a uh, the commander of the pilgrim of the desert and I thought that was really neat and I was very honored. So that sent me down a rabbit hole because uh, not too long after that, that I was knighted and it's like, well, I'm a knight, I should look at the knightly orders what are the knightly orders appropriate for Spain? And that sent me down another rabbit hole looking at all the various orders that were in Spain. And I saw the, the order of Santiago and their purpose in life was not to go on crusade, but to defend people. Um, granted it was mainly Christians on their way for holy pilgrimage, but you know, it wasn't we're going to go out of our way to another country. We're just going to stay in here and protect the people here. It's like, you know, I can, I can get behind that one instead. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Wow. Uh, this is my, you can see the red belt. So this was my uh, knighting ceremony on the field of Estrella with my knight directly behind me and, uh, Everybody else just there supporting me. So it was a very, very good day for me. And, you know, my dream of being knighted on a battlefield uh, came true that day. So awesome. And did uh, Duke Aaron knight you? Yeah, he didn't get me across the face, he got me in the shoulder. <laughs> I was braced so I didn't fall back too far. <laughs> and of course, Mistress Ari, one of my dear friends, um, I blame her for a lot of things. It's all true. When I moved from Aitenbelt to Onstiora, she called ahead on our behalf and said, hey, there's this guy moving in, make him feel at home. And because of her, I got to meet some very good friends, uh, Master Avery, another mod, uh, see Don Aubrey and his wife, who is now my student, uh, Gia Marie called Gia. Uh, she is one of the ladies in charge of the uh, Valkyrie group, which is a, uh, a non-binary support group for fighters of rapier armored it doesn't matter it's basically trying to help people be inclusive and be the fighter that they can be with, without getting the the bad rap that some people do that's really really important work right now yes And that is one of my students, 
next to me there, uh, Mistress Magdalene. Um, she is a pelican. And if I can reel her in from being a pelican long enough, I can work more on getting her a laurel. <laughs> but she has one of the worst or best helium hands that you will ever see. She is the current arts and science uh, minister for the kingdom. Awesome. She jumped in with it with both feet and she's doing a great job. And she knows how to work and organize things and get things done. What is her art? Uh, she is also a colonist as well as she's trying to learn sewing and a few other things. Um, and like me, she's all over the place. One of the favorite things I like about this picture though is the fact that in the background, you've got black adder the second. I didn't, you know, when I first saw the picture, I was like, oh, that's nice. And then I went, wait a minute, is that black adder? <laughs> you know, there's, there's some pictures that you just don't argue with anymore. It's like, yep, I love that picture. It's awesome. I have no idea what I'm doing in this picture. Looking good and feeling good. Yep. <laughs> <clears throat> hand sewing a pair of fighting pants for somebody else this one is not mine but uh somebody had a blowout and i had to sew a cod piece back on a pair of fighting pants for somebody and of course i have the uh industrial thread with the needle to go through it so <laughs> there i am fixing somebody else's stuff And speaking of Gia, there's a beautiful view of her rear side <laughs> in the kitchen. And this is one of her pieces that she's doing that I'm assisting with in Anciora. I love that there's a big sign behind you that says, do not pour mop water, grease, or food down the drain. And you're clearly dumping something down the drain. <laughs> ice water. It's ice oh. water, really. Actually, no, it's hot water. Because one of the uh, the tricks I learned is, while we call it an ice chest, it's actually a thermal insulator. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, the, the tricks that I learned years ago when staging food is you get some really good ice chests. And, and you know, as soon as you start cooking things, you get the ice chest, you clean them out very, very well, very thoroughly, sterilize them. And then you pour boiling water about three or four inches inside them, seal them, and let them heat up. So as your food is getting cooked and you're putting them in containers, you then empty out the ice chest, put the food in the thermal insulator and they will stay warm for hours. Nice. Yeah, especially if you don't have a warming uh, oven or even if you do, these can supplement it for quite a bit. And is this um, black work here? Did you do this embroidery? No, that was some trim I found that wow. looks exactly like uh, red work. And uh, it was at a bargain bin and like, it was like 50 cents a yard. I'm like, I'll take the whole thing. Thank you. Those are the best finds. That looks, I mean, it just looks fantastic. Passes the five foot mark. <laughs> For sure. It fooled me. <laughs> uh, this is me. No, I'm trying to remember. It was a couple of weeks after I won the uh, Kingdom Arts and Science Champion. And someone was asking me a question. I was thinking very seriously about it. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm thinking about right now, but I look like I'm thinking. You look very intent. So tell me about uh, Kingdom Arts and Sciences. What is that like in your kingdom? Well, the, the, the format that I went under, uh, we have what they call the body of work. So bring three distinctly different items to be judged. And so playing to my strengths, I brought a uh, culinary item, a clothing item, and a martial arts item. The clothing item is the black linen doublet with the red cross of Santiago on it, which I had three different pictures of knights wearing the exact same doublet uh, from the latter portion of the 16th century. For a culinary piece, I did a comparison and contrast of gelling agents. I used two different gelling agents to make uh, basically, um, and for, for lack of a better term, it's an almond milk jello. You make your almond milk, you sweeten it, strain it, 
and then you add your uh, gelling agent. One is the uh, the collagen, which they talk about, you know, boiling callus hooves or bones or, or whatever else other items you can use to get the collagen in, to then use to thicken your uh, your jellies. And the other one is like uh, there are a few other organic items that you can use to uh, gelatinize, like agar agar, which was the other one I used. So I did a comparison and contrast. I made the two dishes, uh, and they were just small, like lozenge-sized uh, jellies using the sweetened almond milk and the different gels. And I used different shapes to differentiate between the two. And I made them three days ahead of time and just left them in the fridge. And I pretty much thought I knew what people were going to say. I like this one. I don't like this one because I tasted a couple of them the day after I made them. One thing I didn't take into account, and this is where the experimentation goes in, is after they've sat a few days in a cool environment, the texture of the two jellies changed so that the one I liked originally became crumbly and the one I didn't like became smooth. Oh, wow. And then I went back to thinking about if you're serving a feast for a couple of hundred people in a castle in Europe pre-refrigeration, you're going to make these a few days ahead of time in their molds, and then you're going to stick them down in the cellar where it's cool with some sort of covering over them, like wax paper or, um, you know, uh, wax cloth, something to, to basically keep them protected and let them just set and stay where they are. And so they would have had the ability to let them set and basically let the flavors change and let the textures change over the period of a few days so that they're not trying to cook it and cool it the day of their feast, which is one of the things I, I mentioned to people when they're cooking feasts, is, you know, they had ways of preserving foods ahead of time. So don't think everything has to be cooked the day of, think more of what you can prep ahead of time and serve on the day. But that would be, as I said, the, uh, the almond milk jello or jellies we're, we're a bit of an eye opener on the texture change over a few days. Wow. The, uh, my third entry for arts and science is Tallhofer has a manual for judicial combat in the 16th century or 15th century in specifically in Germany, where a man can do combat against a woman if there's a grievance raised between the two that cannot be settled in court. As such, the man, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to the picture of it sometime soon, but uh, the pictures from Tallhofer's manual show a man in a pit up to his hips with a, staff, a, a rod approximately three feet -ish long. And the woman has standing outside of the uh, pit with basically a sock and a rock. <laughs> and she swings it around her job is to either disable or make the gentleman unconscious or kill him. The man's job is to do the same thing, draw the woman in and kill her or disable her. Regardless of whether you kill or disable them, the loser does get killed because again, this is judicial punishment. There is no second place. There is winner and dead. Oh. And uh, so, and Tallhoffer's manual was basically a way of saying here's my uh, fighting studio please come and learn from me and pay money and you know especially if you want to win this fight you've got next month and not die i can teach you how to win so we we took the steps that he demonstrated and wrote in his uh, text and did the short version of them uh basically how the woman can get the man killed or vice versa while standing in the pit for me and, and whatnot. It was a very fun time. And the fun thing was uh, I made onesies, hooded onesies to fight in. Oh. I, I, went, I was gonna try to find the, um, the onesies. This is me being very there solemn. Go. There we go. There's my wool onesies. <laughs> okay, we'll go back to the other pictures now. I just wanted to pull that onesie picture up. Yes. 
Okay. So the, the next picture you see is me being very solemn at a very formal court event. Um, Master Avery was getting his pelican and uh, I felt the urge to speak for him as a laurel. So I go up being very official with my sombrero. And this is my official Aitenbelt sombrero that I wore in Onciora. And uh, at the same time, another friend of ours who's also a uh, master of defense was for some reason dressed as Kronk from uh, the Emperor's New Groove. <laughs> so we were completely, totally irreverent in court speaking for this gentleman. Perfect. I hope he appreciated it. Oh, he did. <laughs> and again, this is me in Germany. I think this was the year before the last picture, um, because that is my crushed red velvet jack of plates using fender washers that weighed a ton. Mm. And the person I'm fighting is Viscount Brion, one of the uh, princes of Drakenwald. And uh, again, fighting, we're fighting great sword. And that's my flamberge. If you notice the uh, rattan looks like a bit of an S all the way down. I augmented it with some foam to give it that S look. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Fun fighting with those things. And this is myself at uh, an event in Osteora called Laurel's Prize. And that's where uh, non-Laurels display their arts and ask for feedback. And so being a Laurel, I provided feedback and someone went around taking pictures. And you uh, know, I'm wearing a scholar's cap, the uh, square scholar's cap, which is appropriate for a Laurel to wear. Excellent. Yeah, the, we, we have an event, event that we hold now that was based off of this event uh, called Athenaeum. And it's one of the best things uh, to come to the arts in our kingdom. I think it's a great event. So, very exciting. Mm -hmm. And this is myself and uh, Count Brian, who's a brewing laurel, hence the look on our faces, <laughs> where we have our cups. No one's a shot. And to go along with the other great sword, here's long sword at the barrier. And I love barrier fights. It's whether it's a single handed sword at the barrier, German style or long sword at the barrier or even glaive at the barrier. It, it provides, it's a fun visceral fight because you know where the center line is you don't have to chase your fighter all the way around the fighting field and they don't have to chase you. You're pretty much, I'm sitting right here. Let's go belly to belly, sword to sword, glaive to glaive, and just go at it. And it is so much fun. Uh, if you haven't, if, if you ever get into fighting, this is one of the, the, the tournament styles that I particularly endorse is this is a lot of fun. And my lovely wife, my wonderful inspiration. Uh, and this is again, at I believe the same crown list. And uh, I am looking all disheveled after a day of marshalling. And is, is that your special marshalling outfit, the yellow and black? No, that's just what I happen to be wearing that day. There are kingdoms where there's like a whole yellow and black outfit thing that you wear when you marshal. And um, oh, wow. my sister and I are a little obsessed with it because there's like one person that's got this big black and yellow striped pointy hat and a floor length dress thing. And it's super epic. And uh, wow. I think we want to make it a thing <laughs> in our kingdom too. <laughs> No, black and yellow just happen to be my uh, my the colors on my arms. Very cool. And 
here's me uh, doing cut and thrust in Ostiora, having a blast. Those um, are super fancy gauntlets. Did you make those? No, no, no. Those are actually motocross gauntlets. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, gauntlets are, are something that I don't want to mess with because fingers are something that I value and yep. I don't trust my, I, I am terrible at metalwork and I freely admit that. <laughs> so I will pay other people to do that for me. And again, you'll notice I'm still wearing a Morion all these years later because, well, they're cool. They're very cool. Wow. And here's my wife getting ready to kill me. Uh, as you notice, the rock in a sock has wrapped around my hand and my baton, and she is getting ready to pull me forward. And as I am pulled forward out of the hole, she will then fall on me and twist my neck and snap it. That's some, some true love, like right there, wearing that onesie and fighting with you like that. That's awesome. I trust her. <laughs> and I love my wife's smile on this. That's gorgeous. She looks just a little devilish. A little more than devilish, but yeah. <laughs> I like it. And that's the end of the photographs. Yay. I will stop sharing. Very cool. So um, <clears throat> we talked about your laurel path. And we talked about your um, shiv path. Um, let's talk about uh, your master of defense and, and your white scarf and how that all happened for you. Well, um, I received my white scarf, I believe two years after my laurel, maybe three. Um, and then got my, uh, was elevated to the chivalry uh, about five, six years after that. But again, I've been fencing since about 86, 87. When I went to Drakenwald, uh, a lot of the armored fighters, both chivalry and non, also uh, tended to do rapier. Uh, my grand knight, uh, Viscount Sir Axel from Atlantia, had his very own fencing persona, Swishy Lepoque. But then again, Axel has a persona for everything. He has an Italian persona for dancing in Bardic that is Disco Fazzo. Nice. Yes, I, I take, according to my knight, I take a lot after my grand knight. We're trying to figure out who the adult is in the, in the uh, situation. Who needs adults? <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I just, I enjoy fighting regardless of the field and learning about fighting and just having fun and propagating that. If I can help other people enjoy fighting like I enjoy fighting, I will be more than happy to help them at it. Um, how do you use, um, with your mod, it's, it's basically you're a triple peer. How do you use, that comes with a certain um, level of privilege and, and status in the SCA. How do you use that status to, um, to do that, to, to bring people up and, and make things accessible for other folks? Well, I don't consider it a privilege as much as a responsibility because if I consider it a privilege, it's something that can be abused. If I consider it more of a responsibility, then I think of it more as this is a responsibility for me to help others and encourage others. And by putting it, at least for me, putting it in that mindset, it reinforces to me to help others on the path, regardless of who they are. And it keeps me encouraging them. Um, uh, somebody is asking if you met your wife in the SCA. Yes, yes, I did. Um, the first time I met her, she was in grad school in uh, here in Tempe at, in Twin Moons, and I was down in Tucson. Uh, 
and I met her through a mutual friend, uh, Duke Jonathan von Trotha, who was also going to university at the time. Uh, Jonathan and I were old friends from Dragon Ball. And she moved away. And uh, then she moved back a number of years later. And I was recently single and met her again. And uh, we started chatting and noticed a slight mutual attraction and uh, backed away a bit because we wanted to make sure it wasn't just on the rebound. So after waiting a bit, we actually went out on a date and yeah, the uh, feeling was mutual. The attraction was there and uh, now we're married. Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, I'm just looking at uh, seeing if there's any other questions. Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about yet that you want to talk about? Let me rewind the whole thing in my head. <laughs> okay, well, I have a question. Okay. Um, any memories from your smallest feast with John and friends at the Tavern Inn, uh, not an SCA event? Uh, that's from Helen Jeanette. <laughs> Hello, Mistress Helen. She's a, a, another good friend and she may not believe it, but she was a big influence um, on me when I first moved to Aiden Belt. But uh, an interesting story, non-SCA story, again, has to go back to Johannes at a museum in Germany that was about 20 minutes from my house in the city of Traub and Traubach. Um, there's this little hometown museum that I used to go to, to wander through, look at things. And what I enjoyed about this particular down home uh, castle and museum park was they had three suits of armor, mid to late 1500s, early 1600s, that were not in glass cases. Ooh. And at the time I wanted to learn how to make armor along with everything else I was learning. So I would go there and I would look at this armor because I fell in love with the look of it and sketched it out. And I had had my copy of Stone's Glossary of Arms and Arms Armor with me. And, uh, you know, the docent would come by and, and, and see me there sketching this and doing things. And I'd pull it out and point at the various pictures and give it the English name. He'd give me the German name. I'd show pictures of me in armor and, you know, it's like, okay, got it. You're a harmless American, no problem. <laughs> And so one Saturday I'm at this museum and I hear English spoken in the next room and Johannes and Serena, uh, husband and wife come strolling in with Kinder and he's like, hey, what are you doing here? It's like, well, I'm 20 minutes from my house and I'm checking out a suit of armor. What are you doing here? It's like, same thing. It's like, cool. And, you know, he's got his camera out and he's taking close up shots of uh, various pieces of armor. And so he says, it's like, I wish I could get an inside shot of some of these pieces. I'm like, oh, hold on. I grabbed the Morion off of the armor stand, put it in the window of the castle, turn around, spin the armor around about 90 degrees, grab the bottom lame of the pauldron and just fan it straight up. And his jaw hits the floor. But instead of gasping, he just grabs the camera, goes straight up to it and starts taking all these pictures. <laughs> I move things around a bit. He's like, you're going to get thrown out. It's like, now nah, they know me here. So it's like, we do that. And I put the arm, the uh, Morion back on, straighten up the, the armor. And it's like, cool, it's like, cool. And uh, that was a fun jaw dropping moment that you will probably never be able to duplicate in any museum ever. Nope, can't do that kind of thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, but like I said, I'd been going there on and off for about four or five months and, and they knew me by sight. So it's like, yeah, whatever. I'll wipe it down when I'm done. So I have a question. Um, what is it like doing heavy armored fighting with a late period persona without doing a classical knight in shining armor harness? Well, I could have a shiny suit if I wanted, if I was willing to spend the money on it. The, I've been fighting in jack of plates for so long that um, I like the flexibility that it provides. 
if I were to actually get into harness spectin, then yes, I would invest in a full plate suit. But the jack of plates that I made that was based off of one of the Leeds jack of plates, uh, I made what I call my laurel jack because I followed the pattern full. I didn't just armor the parts that get hit the worst or that need to be covered. I did the whole thing. So after I made that jack to a, a not quite museum replica quality and start taking hits with it, I actually had to recalibrate my blows because the armor did what it was supposed to. Nice. But I, I don't think I'm compromising by not fighting in the knight in shining armor bit. Uh, I, I look at what a good foot soldier would have worn in my time frame, and I try to emulate that. Well, and it sounds like it's it makes for a more um, mobile and comfortable fight. I think so. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> what is one of your favorite events to go to? You've been in a lot of different kingdoms. Um, that is actually a difficult one to ask. Uh, I remember there was one year where I hit five major wars in one year. Penzik, Gulf, Australia, Great Western, and Lilies, all in one year. And I'm not a merchant. <laughs> but you know, I had a bucket list to tick off, and that was a pretty big list of ticking off right there. Um, every war has its own flavor. Every event has its own flavor. But for me, it's, it's not so much the event as the people that go to the event that make the event. Because you can have the same event three years in a row and every year it's slightly different because different people show up. I'm more looking at an event of who do I know that's going that I want to see. And you know that that's a big part of it because it, it's a big social organization with violence involved. And, and some art and some service. Yeah. <laughs> And food. Let's not forget the food. And there's food. And and cool clothing. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a really awesome way to totally not answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it, you're on to me. Um, and it, I don't really have a quote unquote favorite event because okay. I'll let you off the hook. <laughs> I won't press it. I'm gonna say if, if if I just lived in one kingdom, I might be able to say this is my favorite event. But if I started going, these are my favorite events from various kingdoms, then you know you still have a list that doesn't right. have a favorite. Right. Well, well it kind of does. Like if if you if someone was asking you uh who was moving to Meridies, let's say what event should I hit? Well, if you're a fighter and if the event still exists, uh, the event that I authorized fighting at decades ago was Gatalop and it was held in, uh, on Dauphin Island at the old fort there. Oh, wow. And yeah, it's it was a, a, a nice centuries old fort that we actually got to fight wars in. And I remember I authorized there my first day fighting. It was, God, blistering cold because it was in March on the coast in Alabama. But it was just, I was so amped up. We had fun there and I didn't miss that event ever. When I, any every year I was in Meridia's that that event happened, I went to it. Um, but, you know, just like living in, in Germany, if you've got a castle to fight in, it sure as heck beats hay bales and uh, plywood walls. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Is there an event uh, that you've heard of that you've never been to that you'd like to go to, like a bucket list event? Well, there are still a few wars I want to hit. I, I have yet to go to West on Tier War. It's on Tier West. <laughs> Depends on who's hosting. I know. <laughs> um, I want to go to an event in Australia and New Zealand. 
sure. and you know there's you know i just want to go where the fun is so i you have probably heard this but at ontario west or west frontier um the rapier folks uh head down to the beach and fight on the beach in, in i've the done that in florida yeah probably a lot warmer in florida Yes, and then having to get the sand out of everything when you're done. <laughs> oh, it's worth it. <laughs> I grew up in Florida. It's not worth getting sand out of everything. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's not the selling point I was hoping for then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, well, um, do you have any other uh, stories that you want to tell? Uh, do you have a particular war story that's a favorite? Well, I remember one of the uh, words of wisdom at my vigil was, now that you got a white belt, you are no longer invisible. Mm -hmm. You know, you won't be able to just saunter through and do things like you used to. People will look you out. So the, the first Pensac I went to, after I was knighted, I was in the wood battle. And one of the things I like to do is just, I don't like shield walls. I don't like bridge battles because I don't, I, I like fighting in the more of an open melee concept. So I look for the holes everywhere just to be a big pain in the rear to the enemy. So I go out there and it's a Penzik and we're in the woods and I see this gap where the enemy should be. It's like, okay. So I start walking up. There's like three guys there. It's like, that's okay. Three guys, whatever. I'll take them. And I start walking up. And next thing you know, the wall is solid. There's like 30 people in front of me. And I'm like, okay, three people, no problem. 30 people, that's going to be pain. So I'd start to step back and I bump into something. I'm like, what? And I look behind me and I've got about 30 people behind me. It's like, where did they come from? I don't know. This is spooky. So I yell out, it's like, well, what are you waiting for? Let's go. And I take like four steps charging. The wall passes me. I take three steps back, stand there, watch the clash and walk away. <laughs> it's like, okay. And I walk over somewhere else and I find another hole. Okay. A couple of people there. So it's like, okay. So I start sauntering up and again, it fills in. I step back, bump into something again. See a couple of the people from before and a whole bunch of other people it's like, and come on guys. And I take a few steps forward. They pass me a few steps back. It's like, okay, now I have to test the theory because it's happened twice. I go find another opening, start walking up. And again, people fill in. I don't bother stepping back this time. I just look over the shoulder and I see two of the guys from the first battle still who are back behind me. It's like, why are you guys following me? He's like, this is fun. It's like, okay, well then let's go have fun. And we, again, we charge. This time I go with them. Cause you know, I've already led them twice and they, apparently they were victorious. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, another one was even with the belt on, I walked through a line at a war practice, turned left and was getting ready to kill somebody where I see a sword across my face and it's a very dear friend of mine, Sir Roland. At the time I was living in the Outland, so I was fighting Outland side. And Roland says, hi, Mingo, no, bye-bye. It's like, fine. I go res, I come back and I look for Roland. It's like, okay, he's looking that way. There's a hole. I walk through the hole, turn left, because if you run, people notice you. So I get in there, I turn left and he's like, no, Mingo, I'm watching you. <laughs> go res now. It's like, I go res, get back to the same spot, and I find a newbie. It's like, hey, you want to kill a knight? This is going to hurt, isn't it? You're smart. No, it isn't. See that guy there? I'm going to do this. I'm going to walk forward. I'm going to turn left. He's going to start walking up behind me. As soon as he gets parallel to you, go behind him and kill him, and I will laugh. He's like, okay. So I walk up there, turn left, and I hear him running up behind me. And then I hear the kid going, you're dead from behind. <laughs> and I look back, it's like, gotcha. <laughs> awesome. It's like a setup for a bad joke, but it was worth it. 
definitely worth it. Um, so you mentioned that uh, in your vigil, uh, somebody talked to you about uh, the nice belt bringing you higher visibility. Um, what advice do you give people um, when you go to their vigils? What's your favorite piece of advice, advice to give? Well, the biggest thing I say is, yes, it's a peerage title. It comes with responsibility. But above all, it's still nothing in the real world. It doesn't get you a free cup of coffee anywhere. Might get you a free beer somewhere at night. <laughs> but uh, there's a, a number of peers around here that, uh, you know, Mistress Ari, uh, Duchess Yanka, that, that crew, it's first rule is don't look like ass. Second rule, don't make your crown look like ass. Third rule, don't be that guy. Be that guy. <laughs> and that basically is the, the, the everything rolled into one. You know, don't be a jerk. Be the, the person that you want other people to be or inspire them to be. And then my own cautionary tale is be careful what you wish for, because when you get it and you realize you've got it, it's a lot to live up to. And it may I, not be exactly what you thought it was. Well, when I first started, I always saw all the people with all the cool clothes, all the cool toys. And it's like, oh, I want to be them. I want to be that guy or that gal or that person. And I started acquiring things because, well, you know, I don't like sleeping on the ground. I like sleeping on a bed. I like fresh cooked meals. Next thing you know, I've got a 10 foot trailer with two pavilions, two <laughs> suits of armor, one, two, three, seven helmets. It just happens. And it's, um, it's one of those things that I try to remind new people, like you've been playing this game for 30 plus years. Um, that's a lot of time to accumulate stuff. Uh, and somebody who's been in five years who feels like they're not all that, they just haven't had the time to get all the stuff. I mean, it comes with time. Yep. Right? And there's nothing wrong with not having all of the stuff. You don't need all of the stuff. <laughs> exactly. And one of the things I enjoy with uh, with the newbies, especially the college crowd, I used to do this a lot down when I was in, uh, in Triscothier with the, uh, the college down there, especially before one of the wars, is we'd go out on what we call the dog robbing expedition. We'd get together early in the morning, go to breakfast somewhere, and then we would hit thrift shops, Army Navy surplus stores, you know, things of that nature. And I would show them things that were good, things that weren't good, what bargains to look for. Um, and especially right after Christmas, all the, uh, you go looking at tree skirts, those make nice mini capes for lady shawls. Oh, you nice. get a big tree skirt that makes a nice fencing cape. Um, cool. I had a friend who found a, a half a bolt of uh, silk for 11 bucks. You know, you get your feast gear there. You know, so many things you, you be, because that's where I got a lot of my stuff when I started was bed sheets, comforters, camping to keep you warm on a budget. Our, all of our tent carpets uh, came from my early years of thrift shopping. I would, I would kind of program and say, okay, today I want to find this. And I almost always would, you know, you go to five, six, 10 thrift stores and you're bound to find what you're looking for. <laughs> oh, my, my dear wife has learned that if I just look at her and say, I need to go to that thrift store now, she'll like, okay. It's hit you. We're going. Because there, there are times where I'm just like, I need to go there. There's something there. I don't know what it is, but I need to get it. I get that too. And then there it is. Ah, the thing that you're looking for. <laughs> that you didn't know you needed. Right. But, but it's got to come home because it's, 
you know, under 20 bucks and it's super cool. <laughs> and I think it takes, there's a special, it takes a really good eye to recognize things that you can turn into medieval-esque things for your time period. Um, and it's kind of amazing what you can do. So it sounds like you have that gift. I've got some friends that have it better than I do. I've seen them just, I've got this feeling, I'm gonna do something. And the next thing you know, it's like, yeah, I dropped a hundred bucks on this. Dude, that's a $2,000 piece. Yeah, I know. So it's out there, the treasure's out there. <laughs> just be willing to explore the thrift shops. Yeah. Or the random garage sale around the corner. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And if you um, if you research your persona or the field uh, that you're really interested in well enough, you get an idea of what the aesthetic is, and um, that makes you better e able to evaluate items that might fit in with that, or could use a little adjusting to mm -hmm. to become just right. Yeah. You know, woodcuts are your friend. Look at all the woodcuts of, of various things and portraitures. Look in the background. Um, I picked up a, a book on Flemish clothing for my wife a few years, a number of years ago. But the what one of the things that got me to buy that book was the Flemish portraits in there had a uh, one of the pictures was called the uh, Pancake House. And I was looking at it for the food that was in it. The vegetables that were on display, uh, as well as you know the the cookware. For sure. Yeah, the dress is nice, but did you see that fruit in the back? I think that's this kind of squash. <laughs> and you know, did you see the pot that's in there with the feet and the long handle? I want that. Yeah. So pay attention to those little details. Those are good things to notice. Awesome. Well, do you have any parting words before we go? Well, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to all my friends and students out there, especially in Osceola that haven't seen me in forever. I almost got to see him last uh, last year going to Gulf Wars. I got right to the Texas border when I got the phone call that, uh, hey, Gulf Wars is canceled, go home. So to all, all my students far and wide and all my friends far and wide that are actually watching this, I know you're mocking me. I will mock you back because <laughs> that's how we give love. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much for spending this couple hours with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, tomorrow, my sister and I are interviewing um, Dame Bridget Ross. Uh, she's a lion, a monteer, and a pelican who moved out of kingdom, and I am totally forgetting where she moved to. Um, so we'll find out about that tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you very much. Um, and thanks everyone for watching. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.